-hmm. Some will open this video and then they'll assume... And we'll turn it off. They'll assume you're a musician, but you're not. Evidently not. For those who don't know, you are a scientist, an astrophysicist, and you and your friend are close to discovering the ninth planet in the solar system. Uh, we'll discuss this a little down the line. Okay. Uh, first, please explain to the confused people at home how come, uh, I mean, we're at your workplace. This is the California Institute of Technology, uh, but we're speaking Russian. And yep. your name is Konstantin Batygin. My name is Konstantin Batygin, and we are speaking Russian. How come? I was born in Russia in 1986, in Moscow. We lived there until 1994. In 94, we moved, but not here. We moved to Japan. We stayed in Japan for six years, a little under six years. Hence, we came to the US when I was about to turn 14. A somewhat stochastic trajectory that was. I graduated from high school here, and then I went to university. At the university, my major, which is my specialization, was astrophysics. Overall, uh, in my first year, I was kind of into it, it was cool, but I truly fell in love with science in my second year, because I met my then mentor, Greg Laughlin. Uh, I met him at a party. We instantly kind of clicked, and uh, I started working with him. I got into research. By the end of my bachelor's, i.e. by the end of um, four years of college, I'd published my first paper, together with Greg. After that, I applied to postgrad and ended up right here in Coltec. Here I graduated, I mean, I got my PhD, and as I was finishing my PhD, Coltec hired me uh, to be a professor. A professor is someone who divides time between theoretical studies and teaching students. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. uh, this wasn't immediate, by the way. Like, they hired me back in 2012, but they, they went, how about you leave for a couple of years and then come back? This is a standard practice in the U.S. Something the American academia tries to avoid is, um, is giving you professorship rights where you graduated. The idea is to prevent the regurgitation of the same ideas at a school. People need to move around to spread new ideas. Bring them over from somewhere else. Yes, that's right. So after getting my PhD, I went to France, spent some time there, and afterwards I stayed at Harvard for 18 months. Actually, I never had any doubts that uh, a professor's door would look like this. That's my band. Where's you? That's me. And... Uh, you sure? Yeah, time changes. It uh, it changes us. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, that's me. This is, what, about five years, maybe four years ago? Okay, uh, what about this one? That's Le Verrier. Le Verrier was a French mathematician who discovered Neptune by means of math. Uh-huh. This, uh, this is just something I found online. I like the fact that... Uh, Someone just spray-painted NASA on their van, and someone, uh, someone commented, seems legit, <laughs> meaning looks proper, looks official. <laughs> How do people react to the fact that a professor wears a mohawk? Uh, dyed one, too. To be honest, I, I never asked. I never asked anyone how they, how they felt about it. But do you have bosses here? Well, uh, there's the head of the division where I work, but we have never discussed this. I mean, we talk a lot, but we never talked about... Naturally, we discuss science, grants, weather, but no one's ever asked me about my hair color. I'm not the only one like that. We have, uh, we have this girl in the division. Uh, she just recently became a professor herself. She's got... Tattoos all over her body. Uh -huh. They're more, you know, um, apparent. More noticeable than hair. 
rituals. Yeah. I understand you don't have this thing down here that if you're a professor, you have to present certain gravitas, status, and, and so on. Let me show you. Hold on. Hold on. Are you saying I don't present gravitas? Check out this gravitas. Check out this status. <laughs> Who's that guy? <laughs> He's a professor he too, is, isn't he? Uh, he's a professor of... Uh, he's actually a pretty famous professor of sciences of atmospheric dynamics. Yeah, he's a very smart dude. I have a ton of respect for him, that's for sure. What's going on in this picture? I do want to say that it's just a normal class, and that's him mid-lecture, but no, this is... Uh, we have a tradition here. At the end of every academic year, we have a large party. At this party, they mainly... It's a party where students come up with uh, different jokes. Uh, they come up with pranks to get back at their professors, and professors usually play along. It's, um, it's something like... Uh, like a kapusnik, like a stage yeah, yeah, show or yeah, some yeah. sort. It's a stage show with the purpose of, um, of giving students a chance to somehow make fun of, uh, of their professors. It's great fun. Are you a scientist too? Yes. Uh, so what do you do? Astrophysics. So you do same things? Similar stuff, yeah. So it's like what Constantine does, only he does theory, I do observations. We both study extrasolar planets. What do people usually think when they see Constantine with his hair and his hobbies? I mean, do they believe that he's a scientist? At first, no, but then they read his papers and they get it. Too bad he can actually hear us, but let's pretend he cannot. As far as I understand, uh, he's sort of a science rock star around here, is that Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Uh, why? Uh, I mean, first of all, he blazed through, through his PhD in just four years publishing like 12 papers in the meantime on the whole range of subjects, on Jupiter, on how planets are the size that they are, how they evolve in their orbits, that sort of stuff. Then he like popped over to Harvard University for a couple of months, got, uh, got a degree over there and got a call tech as a professor. Pretty baller. Which part of Moscow did you live in? Universitet Metro Station. We lived in this uh, apartment building and they had uh, a fish store on the ground floor. Grandpa would occasionally buy fish uh -huh. in this store and bring it upstairs. It was uh, still alive and we'd let it out to swim. In the tub. Yeah, in Ooh, the tub. We did that too. And then I personally... Only uh, when I was about 20, I did realize that the fish that used to swim in the tub and then disappeared was the same fish that we ate later. Uh, you didn't know it back then? I had some sort of a cognitive dissonance. I thought, huh, there used to be fish here, but it's probably left through, <laughs> through the sinkhole. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's something a vegetarian would say. Are you a vegetarian? No, I... I was vegetarian once between uh, between lunch and dinner. <laughs> we have a lot in common. <laughs> we all love bashing taxi drivers in the kitchen, in the gym, but we rarely ask ourselves, how do taxi companies hire drivers? November is the month that the Sovereign Internet Act officially came into our lives. There's no telling how it will affect Russian YouTube or our future. It's the best month to find out how people get jobs as taxi drivers. Because you just, well, never know. We'll use GET as our example. GET has a complex, intricate system of selecting the best drivers in the city. Because the driver is the number one factor that determines a trip's safety. I will go through their selection process to find out if I could be a taxi driver. First, you fill out a form, record a video resume, and complete a test based on a special presentation. If you pass the first stage, they invite you to the driver training center. What are essential qualities for a driver? Hi everyone! In my opinion, a driver needs to drive safely. 
As a passenger, a few things I would ever complain about and rate someone with a one star are speeding, not turning on the turn signal, driving without a seatbelt, and getting distracted by your phone or, as painful as it is to admit, by YouTube. Let's talk rules and reality and how they mix and match. Research shows that if you are wearing even the most expensive tracksuit, people will identify you as a threat. Self-explanatory, right? The taxi driver in a tracksuit stereotype is real. We don't have a silent driver button. Dialogue is vital. The trip is the key part of our job. How can I address you, in case you don't know? Alona, for your safety, could you fasten your seatbelt? I'm a careful driver, but this is Moscow. Trips with animals, anyone had those? If it's something big like a crocodile or a Saint Bernard, just call the operator, calm and simple. We got vans, we can handle it. Service for the clients, peace of mind for us. Colleagues, look for test one. They have numbers. It says city test and service test. Plenty of time, colleagues. Take your time, we finished on schedule. Which of these streets intersects the third ring? Svinigorodska? Okay. Okay, normally you'd wait until 6 p.m., but we'll try to ask if I passed right now. So, uh, I can find out if I passed right now. Yes, Yuri, what do you think? Uh, I definitely made a mistake on the city test at least once. Right. Maybe, maybe twice. Or maybe six. <laughs> but the one I know is about Proletarska subway station. Well, you guessed it, 9 out of 10. No, I don't yeah, ten. congratulations. You would have even okay. made it to business class. What about service? Uh, bottom estimate, 5 out of 10. Right. Uh, top estimate, 8 out of 10. Uh, well, neither. You got 10. So congratulations. You can now be a get driver. I would seriously get the yep, job? Yep, Holy crap. Well, now I feel slightly better about my YouTube-less future. But since I can't afford to ride in the back seat for now, after an experience like this, doing so will feel cozier and safer. Now I have a better understanding of the slogan, we care about who's driving you. If you too care about who's driving you, follow the link below and check out the difference yourselves. We're in the city of L.A. neighborhood called Pasadena. Uh, is it always hot in here? You know, it is, it is hot in here pretty much all the time. Occasionally, the temperature will drop to 10 or 15 degrees Celsius. It happens. Uh, but um, when this happens, people can start to panic. How are we going to survive? It's like the end of the world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but this only lasts for about four hours, then it comes back to normal. So, this is a seismometer. It's a... Or a seismometer in Russian. Seismometer, yeah. yeah. This device basically measures Earth's movement. It measures earthquakes. It's a very primitive model. I'm not sure when exactly it was invented in, uh, in this particular form. But modern seismometers are these... Basically, they are computers with GPS and stuff. Do you stick them in the ground or just put them down? So, you stick them. Uh, some stations stand on these uh, tripods. They look a bit like um, like cameras that stand on uh, on three on the tripods. And uh, while some seismometers from from the newest generation, you can you can just drop them on the ground. We have uh, a professor down here in Caltech who is busy developing seismometers made of uh, wires, the same wires that transfer internet data. He makes use of uh, he makes use of light traveling through these wires to to build an interferometer. Uh, what's that over there? This graph shows real time um, measurements from from this seismometer. If we jump up, we'll produce a small earthquake in this room, and uh, it should register it. So, like you see, I jumped up, uh, and it registered my earthquake. Look, I, I cannot jump, I have a knee injury, but uh, let's try it with, uh, with Sergey. Sergey. <laughs> you see, you see, it went off the chart. This is the very place where they film that corner, right? right? there. Somewhere in there, they shoot Kuji podcast with one of the hosts, Andrei Kanyaev, who yes. is uh, considered one of Russia's primary science journalists. Koltek is American Bauman, would you say? 
Ну, you could say that, yes. When they sent the Phoenix spacecraft to Mars, all it could do was stand up and take pictures. But they made the coverage super interesting. All it had to do was they sent a spacecraft that was supposed to land on Mars, stretch its claw out and literally scratch the surface in hopes of finding ice right under it. It scratched it and it found ice. They were filming it and did constant updates. Everyone was like, this is awesome, because think about it, they literally sent this relatively small and inexpensive machine to Mars and found water on it. That's when people start talking about Caltech. And thanks to the Big Bang Theory, Caltech became a home to all these physicists. We know plenty about 90s Russia that you left, but what was 90s Japan like when you moved there? Oh, 90s Japan was incredible. We arrived and I I remember the day we arrived in Japan like it was yesterday. We landed, got off the plane in, um, in Narita and got on a train. In Narita, there's a train that goes from the airport to city proper. The train is called Skyliner. The first thing I saw was that this train had four seats and um, some dude came up and turned them around. It was like... This is insane. This is the 24th century. I mean, he to just... To face the way the train was moving. No, he had friends with him, and uh, he turned the seats around so they would face inward. The second shock uh, was when the train started to move, but I didn't hear I start moving. The train was completely silent. Obviously, after the Soviet subway, even an eight-year-old me could notice the difference. And in general, Japan is, you know, Japan is a wonderful country, but it's, uh, how do I put it, it's very specific. I mean, they, probably more than any other country out there, they preserved a lot of their Japanese culture, even though they, they live like, despite being a first world country, With all the first world's conveniences, Japan remains its true Japanese self. They don't have cultural diffusion. One somewhat weird example of this was when we lived in, in this apartment building. But in this building, I still don't know why, but for some reason, approximately once a month or so, the residents would come out. Uh, there was a lawn in front of it. And they'd crawl around and literally cut the grass by hand. Like, you crawl around and you just do this sort of manual lawn mowing. We said, but why? And everyone was like, well, you got to crawl. So they're all crawling, right? And then they just randomly stop. The next day, a man with a, a lawnmower shows up and cuts the grass. And this surrealism, as far as I noticed, was everywhere and, uh, and in everything in Japan. Uh, but you don't know why they did it. I still have no idea. Some suggest maybe they were picking out weeds. No, there were no weeds there. It was just grass. So, yeah, I still don't understand that. Or we had this class... I, I never fully grasped it. Officially, it was a calligraphy class where you learn to... A calligraphy. Calligraphy, yes. Uh, you learn to write characters, but they, they give you an hour to write one. One character. Yeah, you sit down, you sit on the floor, you have a sheet of paper in front of you and some ink. You can either write it quickly and then just sit there for 59 minutes or do a stroke once every 10 minutes or so. You can do it however you like, but either way, you'll sit on the floor for 60 minutes, okay? This is something impossible to imagine in America, to make... Uh, Eight-year-olds sit down on the floor for 60 minutes without fidgeting. In that sense, Japan is very unique. It preserves its, its own ways. Free people do science. You can't do science if you are not a free person. Why? Because you have to 
Imagine everyone keeps telling you uh, there is no ninth planet, there is not. It's like what you learned at school, nothing beyond Pluto. And you go, nah, bullshit. You straight up tell this to everyone. Why? Because your brain works in such a way that you can say, nah, all of you before me were wrong. You were all slightly off before I came along. And I'll correct you a little bit. I'll correct all the textbooks. And you can see this everywhere. Even in China, a country far from being free, universities are like tiny islands of freedom where you can. Everywhere else in China you can't. But in unis you can, a free person expresses themselves however they want. Say they want to wear a suit jacket, if they want to distinguish from the masses with a suit jacket, they will. If they want to dye their hair and play in the band, sure thing, you can do, go ahead. Being free in your mind is what matters, because it's the only condition for doing science. This is an equation, this is a drawing. Uh, this part I know, uh, my I'm, knowledge yeah. does reach that far. I'm currently um, developing a model of formation of moons, of gas giants. There's currently no good theory explaining where Jupiter's and Saturn's moons came from. It's an, it's an open question. Uh, sorry, uh, first thing first, what's a moon of Saturn? A moon is like a satellite planet. Yes, it's like a satellite planet that orbits Saturn. Um, one could ask a trivial question, why does it exist? Like, where did Saturn, how did Saturn get a moon? There's currently no good answer to this. We need a theory. Fundamentally, we know all these laws, all the physical laws that play a role in this model. In this theory, we know them. It's gravity, it's hydrodynamics. We understand them. The question that remains without, without a good answer, how do these laws match together to generate the system uh, that we are witnessing? Think about it as, uh, as a Lego. We have all of our blocks. blocks in front of us, and we know what shape they have to take in the end. The question is, how do they all fit together? In what order you put them yeah, together, right? in what order and how, yes. So you sit around here with your formulas, and you try to discover this order through them. Yes. Is this a correct brief description of theoretical explanation of a phenomenon? Yes, that's effectively what all of our theoretical astrophysics is. Theoretical astrophysics is a field where you know about certain cosmic phenomena. For example, you know that the solar system exists and has this particular structure, and you know that the laws of physics involved in this are X, Y, and Z. And then you ask the question, how do you combine these fundamental laws of physics to get the answer that you can in fact see in space? How exactly do you work? Like, you come to work, you, you sit down, and you sit here and think what to write down? Yeah. I mean, yes, 99% of my time is I start writing something, I keep, I keep writing, and then I realize that it's all wrong. I wipe it off and start over. Basically, 99% of my work leads, leads nowhere. Wow. Does it affect motivation? Not, not at all, because every time, every time you hit a dead end, well, there are actually no true dead ends in science. Hitting a dead end is uh, um, usually the moment when you realize that your original your original uh, premise, so to say, uh, that, that it was all wrong, right? Uh, you see where your mistake was and you start over. And it's an iterative process. Uh, one you do again and again and again, but the whole thrill, the fun part of it is that even when you get an answer that's wrong, you still learn something new about how it all works. Every time. You might not get the system that you wanted. Again, if, uh, if we go back to the Lego analogy, every time, every time you build something, you can, you can examine it and go, okay, that's not what I wanted to build, but it's still an interesting case, and I also learned something new. So I just... Uh, Break it down and start over. Yes. What's an academic paper? Is mm -hmm. something in non-scientific life comparable to it? 
Well, that's... It's like a musician releasing an album. Yes, it's an album. And in an article, you usually make a scientific proposition or, or you prove something, So correct? let's take his article, sure. because all sciences work differently. Hugo, let's assume... I mean, Hugo, I have this data. I checked out the way objects in the solar system orbit the sun, and there's an anomaly. I notice this anomaly, and you can see it too. And then you go, I assume that this anomaly exists because there is a planet. So, this assumption is the freedom that you need. Because you could write, I found an anomaly, whatever the fuck it is, but instead you go, it's probably a planet. People check out your evidence and go, yeah, you know, yeah. And you also provide mathematical proof. Yes, of course, proof. yes. It's basically... There is the conceptual part, I described the idea to you, and there is the math behind it, because you need to do all these calculations, build graphs and models, so people could get in there themselves and make sure you didn't make it up. When someone records an album, l- let's make it simpler. Yeah. When someone writes a song, what do they want to get out of it? Ideally, the very first golden song the musician writes, what do they want? I mean... Not everyone wants it to be popular. Certainly no. They want it to somehow resonate with the hearts and souls of others. Yes, some people, like Kurtz, even shoot themselves because their music became a commodity. But in reality, when you write a song, when someone writes a song, they want others to listen to it and go, awesome. So that's the real reason people write academic papers. You write a paper to then meet someone at a conference, one of those who will get it, and you go, fucking cool, huh? And they go, for real, dude, it blew my mind. And you are like, I know, right, it totally worked out. And you're both like, shit, let's do some more math. It's 100% means of transportation. I almost every day ride a longboard to work because uh, I live relatively nearby, maybe 15 minutes away. Neat. Something I discovered is uh, that when you're riding a longboard with a dog, the dog uh, can actually pull you. So, every day I, well, not every day, but a couple of times a week, I bring my dog and uh, and it stays here. It kind of reminds me like as in the north yeah. pulling uh, sleds. Yeah, only I have a pull pit bull. Is it okay to bring your dog to the office? It's totally fine. The only issue I had was uh, about a month ago or so, I tied her to this chair. And the chair is... Uh, massive. Yeah, it's massive. The door was open, I'm sitting here, uh, writing some formulas, and uh, a tiny dog walked by in the hallway, and I suddenly noticed with my peripheral vision that uh, this huge chair is flying across the office, but, uh, well, but it was fine, the little dog lived. The chair survived too, right? The chair survived too, yes, zero losses, so to say, yeah. Let's talk about the ninth planet. All right, so you and your friend, uh, Mike Brown, uh, found the ninth planet of the solar system. First off, I understand you haven't discovered it yet. You only propose that it exists, uh, but you need to prove that it exists. Yes, it's actually not that complicated. Uh, what we see in the gravitational signal of the, of the ninth planet, I mean, light is an electromagnetic phenomenon. Light is just an electromagnetic waves, right? And uh, we we are just used to the idea that um, to consider something proven, we need to see it. What we can see is the gravitational effect of the ninth, uh, of the ninth planet. Right, so you saw this effect, and you assume that the effect is caused by a planet. Yes. Uh, can this be wrong? Yes, and... Uh, you can even... The odds that it's a mistake can be calculated. It's 0.2%. Well, there are tiny odds. It's 1 in 500, meaning meaning that uh-huh. uh, there is 1 in 500 chance that this entire theory doesn't work. Mike Brown is the same person who reworked... Well, well not reworked, but rather changed what they teach kids at school. They taught us in school that there are nine planets in the solar system. But in the middle of 10s, in the middle of 2000s. Yes, 2000s. Yeah, in 2005 or 2006. 2006. No, uh, Mike Brown said that Pluto uh, doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. I mean, that yeah. Pluto isn't a planet. Yeah. 
Um, his Twitter account is even called uh, Pluto Killer. Yes. And now the same man discovered the ninth planet. Uh, first off, why isn't Pluto a planet? Because it's small? Because Pluto is really small, yes. Well, uh, let me tell you a story of how Pluto was discovered in 1930. It was discovered by an astronomer named uh, Clyde Tumba. When they discovered Pluto at the time, weirdly enough, they too were looking for a large planet beyond Neptune. And they thought that Pluto was the large planet that they'd been looking for. They originally thought, well, they had a theory that Pluto was seven times more massive than the Earth. Turns out it was 500 or 5,000 times smaller than the Earth. So calling it a planet was a mistake in the first place. Ah. So such a tiny space rock cannot count as a planet? Yes. The difference is like between a continent and an island. The whole... um, astronomical process, uh, the way we look for objects in the outer reaches of the solar system, including the ninth planet, is um, you take a telescope and you look up there. If you think there's something in that area, you look up there and you take pictures again and again every night. If you took three, you can find... uh, Three nights uh, is the minimum amount required to find an object in the uh, in the solar system. Why? Because in those three days, the Earth will move. The Earth will move along its orbits, right? Stars in our galaxy are basically uh, infinitely far away from us. They don't move in the night sky, whereas uh, objects in the solar system do. It's the same effect as uh, when you're driving a car, you look out, and uh, there's a cloud 100 kilometers away from you, and uh, to you it seems like the cloud isn't moving, while a tree that you pass, it seems to be moving, although in reality both uh, the cloud and the tree are stationary, basically, and uh, it's you who is moving, but to you it seems like objects closer to you move faster. It's called parallax, and uh, it's an effective... Um, It's just uh, that simple. So, to find an object within the solar system, you just need to take pictures of the sky every night. What does it look like on practice? Uh, You go to an observatory. Mm -hmm. It's in Hawaii, isn't it? Yes, this observatory is in Hawaii. Okay, and uh, you watch the sky at night. Uh, What time do you start your hunt? We drive out at around 5 p.m., Yeah, so at 5 p.m. we drive up the mountain, we leave at about 6 a.m. You stare into the telescope the whole night? The whole night. Uh, Right. I heard it's ridiculously expensive. Yes, the telescope that we're using is, um, is a Subaru telescope. Subaru telescope belongs to the National Observatory of Japan. But it's in Hawaii. It's in Hawaii, yes. But, uh, but Hawaii is the Americans. U.S. territory, isn't it? Hawaii is a uh, U.S. territory, but uh, on um, on Mauna Kea, it's uh, a mountain on the largest island. Uh, there's currently like 13 or 12 telescopes. They are Japanese, American, British, Canadian. They have telescopes from all over the world. Basically... The top of uh, Mauna Kea, and there is another mountain in Chile, they're probably the best places for observatories in the world because there are many factors that play here. Air humidity, the less humid uh, the air is, the better. Stratosphere, turbulence. If you are in a part of the world where the stratosphere is less turbulent, it's good for astronomy because light doesn't refract. Obviously, The height, all these things play a huge role here. I don't know how much it costs exactly, but I think it's cost around one dollar a minute or so. I heard it's one dollar a second. One dollar a second. Yeah, probably a second. So a single night is twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, sounds about right. Uh, Who pays for it? So the Japanese government covers uh, part of the cost. It's uh, part of their national observatory. When we use it, we do the so-called exchange. Uh, There is 
the Japanese telescope. There are two American telescopes called uh, the Keck Observatory. Next to it, uh, that Coltec invested lots of money into. So several nights a year, we switch. When astronomers from uh, Caltech uh, or another Californian university need to use the uh, Subaru, we give the Japanese uh, a night of Keck. For now, it's a hypothesis, right? You're just speculating that this is the ninth planet. When will it become a discovery? When will they consider it one? Uh, I think the moment we get the first images of the of the planet, it's going to be a close case. Like, uh, it's going to be... It will become a fact, and uh, it will give way to a myriad of new interesting scientific questions, but uh, that's when our hypothesis will become fact. Wait, but is this a predictable time frame? This image, you basically hope to snatch it like a lottery ticket. Pretty much. So you're trying to catch uh, an image, and you could spend your whole lives doing it? Potentially, yes. If someone from Japan, Britain, or, or Russia finds this planet first, will the discovery count as theirs? Yes, it will, and I'll be very happy, because I... See, on the one hand, I'd love to be the first to catch the light of the ninth planet. On the other hand, it, it will be a hundred times better if someone discovers it sooner rather than, uh, rather than if we wait for, for decades or so. But wait, why do they say you made the speculation? Anyone could. Like, yes. did you offer any proof? Of course, yeah. Even uh, Sergei and I could have gotten up there yes. and said that there was a ninth planet. Yes, naturally anyone can just speculate and uh, fantasize. You could say, maybe there's even two of them. Or maybe two at least... Planet. Yeah. There you go, you see? Uh, the thing that sets our work apart from... Um, run-of-the-mill fantasizing is that it's mathematical proof. It's a dynamic model of the solar system beyond Neptune uh, that would have looked differently if the ninth planet didn't exist. The entire trick was that if we figured out that uh, orbits of asteroids beyond Neptune have uh, a very particular structure that hides within uh, uh, the hides within it the signal of the ninth planet that there is something beyond neptune which produces this uh, structure is that correct yes something uh, we didn't know up until the mid 90s uh, was that there is a second belt of ice uh, asteroid beyond Neptune. Most people know about the original asteroid belt located between Mars and uh, Jupiter. Like, uh, when we see an asteroid, everyone thinks of, uh, of that belt. But turns out there is a second asteroid belt in the solar system beyond Neptune that was discovered only recently, and... It's the structure of orbit of this uh, second asteroid belt that indicates that there's a ninth planet in the solar system. If I'm not mistaken, uh, in the Big Bang theory, Sheldon Cooper was researching the string theory, wasn't he? Yes, string theory. Yeah, and um, at some point he struggled with depression because of the fact mm -hmm. that you cannot prove it. He even thought of leaving science. Yeah. Have you asked yourself the question, what you'll do if you uh, cannot find this planet? Um, if years go by and you turn 40, then 50, but it just keeps eluding you, you know? I can see two possible ways this could, uh, this could go down. One, uh, we continue waiting and looking, and either we or someone else or just an automated telescope, because the next generation of telescopes, like the project called uh, LSST, uh, it's just going to be an automatic telescope that we will we'll take pictures of the sky every night. Not the whole sky, but uh, a pretty large sector of it. Maybe one of these projects will discover it. Okay, great. Then, option number two is that we made some huge mistake and this 0.2% possibility shows that this structure of the asteroid belt beyond Neptune that I mentioned doesn't actually exist. Or, uh, or perhaps we misread it somehow and uh, the ninth planet simply, simply doesn't exist, okay? 
This is possible too. The odds, the odds of that are 0.2%. The weirdest scenario is that this structure exists, but we can't find the ninth planet and no one can find it for decades. That would be truly... It would be truly odd, and uh, at that point we'll have to start thinking of more exotic explanations, like maybe the sun has uh, a halo of uh, dark matter or something like that, so we'll have to keep thinking. But are you scared? I'm not scared because there's, there's really nothing to be scared of. See, uh, I go to to the boxing club, and every Saturday um, some, someone pummels my face. That's when I'm scared. But when it comes to planets, it's okay, you know? <laughs> and the biggest question on this whole subject. When you made this announcement, everyone was hyped. They wrote a lot about you. Uh, for several days, you became a real star, not just the science. But here's the question. When they prove, like, tell me, American, this is a quote from the film Brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. remember. It's just that I felt like uh, I was 13 again. That's when I first watched it. Right. So tell me, American, say you discover this planet, then what? It's, uh, How will it help us, your regular boys and girls, who are pretty much outside of science? Hmm. It's a great question. Look, uh, Will this make our everyday lives, will this change everyday life? Of course not. No one's going to walk around going, the ninth planet exists, it will now, I will now live uh, an honest life. <laughs> Zero people will say that, all right? <laughs> that would have been so great. <laughs> one though. can only dream, but, um, <laughs> but, but it will completely change our understanding of of the outer solar system. Why is this important? I think it's important because humanity, uh, we have something in our DNA that makes us unhappy uh, when, when we are not looking for something new, you know? Humanity, maybe it's something evolutionary that we have this... Um, some, some sort of a drive to say, if you live uh, in some in some hole, you just have to know what's behind that mountain. Is there something beyond it or not? When you reach the ocean, what's there behind the ocean? Uh, is there something else out there? Once you uh, have a bare bones understanding of this planet, uh, that same drive makes you ask questions. What's beyond our planet? What's out there beyond the edge? of the solar system. This curiosity is a fundamental part of, of humanity. Say someone finds this planet. Would be cool if Botigan did. Yeah. Uh, what then? What do we care? What will Sergei, who's laughing his ass over there, get? Yeah, absolutely nothing. It's the greatest mystery of science. That's a good question. I get asked this a lot. You sound just like Putin. You didn't expect this, did you? When Vladimir Putin talks about fundamental science, he basically says, we need to invest in fundamental science so that in three years we'll make this sort of breakthrough. Right? Wrong. Fundamental science is a mysterious thing. It's like, you know, if you build pretty houses, people in them live better than they would have in shitty ones. If you let kids listen to different kinds of music, they seem to mature into more interesting adults than if you didn't. Fundamental science just exists. All those iPhones and all that, they are byproducts. They are the result of some other Batygin sitting down and... Uh, an example here, uh, here's how they discovered image sensors used in cameras. IBM was like, guys, we think semiconductors are the gold. Study them. So they all started studying them, and a couple of dudes met one night and went, we're trying to create memory based on semiconductors, but guys from the next office beat us to it. We got to come up with something else ASAP. They designed some Duda in 30 minutes, built it the next day, and some 40 years later got a Nobel Prize for it. Because they got together and went, it would be cool if we could build a camera out of this. 
It wasn't the other way around. They didn't get together like, let's build a camera. That, that's how this works. It's all byproducts. Simply put, if we take a different metaphor, science is basically a field. It's rich soil. Yes. You're from Tambov, aren't yes. you? It's rich soil that you need to water. And something will, if nobody fucking steals it. Yes, of course. Something useful will eventually always. come out of it. Yes, it always does. There's never been a time where people put effort into fundamental science, fundamental science advanced and yielded nothing. Because, like I mentioned, scientists who are obsessed with it. Did you know that in uh, Hungary, for instance, they proved many interesting theorems in concentration camps? But, you know, people on this brink, when you can be pretty much dead the next day, carried on and proved theorems because it was important for them. Schwarzschild came up with black holes. He was dying from pemphigus. It's an autoimmune disease. He managed to write two papers before dying. They were both revolutionary. He was in a rush to get them done because it's an awesome subject. He knew that, as I said, He won't come up to others again to go cool, huh? But someone else will, and it will be fucking awesome. While we were setting up, I found this flag over here. Yep. Uh, can you tell us what this is? It's a flag dedicated to the ninth planet that was um, sent to me by by a girl named Emily uh -huh. from, from Canada. I think uh, she's from Montreal. She made it herself. She she just sent it to you? Is she a fan of yours? Yeah, she just sent it to me. Yeah. And uh, I've been I've been looking for a place to hang it where on the one hand it's um uh, on the one hand it's visible, on the other hand uh, not too much, you know. <laughs> well, <laughs> not too much. Well, you know, I mean, um when most people see a flag, they tend to associate it with, uh, with, with some sort of meaning. Something I noticed from practice is that when people see a flag that they've actually never seen before, they give it their own interpretation, usually a negative one. Wait, so scientists get female fans too? Well, it's kind of, you know, I struggle to call her a fan in the sort of uh, standard sense of the word, but um, I've got at least one, yes. Uh, this nut you have? Yes, yes. Here's the story of this nut. My, uh, my wife and I went to Montreal. It's in Canada. Yes. We missed our flight. The, um, the flight was at something like midnight or 10 p.m. They said, we'll rebook you for a flight uh, departing at 5 a.m. We said, okay, this basically means that if we book into hotel, we'll uh, sleep for 30 minutes before we have to drive back here. So we decided to um, to stroll around Montreal until until the morning, hopping from bar to bar. When I woke up uh, on the plane, I had this nut, okay? Uh, and I've worn it ever since. So you and your wife got so drunk that you woke up on the plane? W with her, yes. The good part was that we both ended up on the same plane. <laughs> and he was heading in approximately the right direction. Uh, scientists drink? Only moonshine. <laughs> Do you drink moonshine? No, no, no. I only drink... Uh, uh, I don't drink moonshine, I only taste it. Your family moved to the States when uh, you were 13. Yes. You met your future wife mm -hmm. on the day you arrived. First day, yes. Your quote, meeting her that day confirmed what the USA brochure had said. America really is a great country. Well, given the kind of women, she's, she's Russian, by the way. Oh. Yep. Uh, hold on. You met when you were 13. Yes. But the relationship started later. No, it started there and then. You know, uh, when you've got two black holes... Okay. And they share share an orbit. They send out gravitational waves, uh, which causes their orbits to shrink. This process takes um, a few seconds. We we are pretty much like that too. You've been together ever since. Yes, but uh, you know we 
We broke up for about a year in 2001. Yes. From 2000, no, uh, it's certainly in 2001. Uh, then we got back together in 2002. And then you got married. Yeah, we got married in 2009. No shit. Yes, since then we've, um, it's pretty weird, you know, because uh, when, when we meet people and uh, I'll say, yes, Olga and I uh, have been together for 20 years, and uh, they'll go, wait, how old are you? Are you like 50? <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, since 13 years old. She was 15 at the time. When you're with someone for so long, is it difficult? No, it's really easy. What do you mean? <laughs> uh, no, it's... Um, how do I put it? I think that when, when you're with someone for a long time, you go through iterations, you change, and the person changes as well. And so... Uh, when, when, when you change together, as time goes on, uh, you, you arrive at a mutual understanding that you can only get with time. We immediately liked each other, at least I liked her immediately, but true understanding, deep understanding can only develop with time. And uh, only when you deal with certain, like, um, with... Uh, with, with certain vices together, is just, uh, it just comes naturally when, uh, when you're with someone for, for a long time. We've never talked to someone who knows about space as much as you do. So we wanted to talk to you about space in the simplest terms possible. Okay. Even simpler than before, okay? Okay. First off, did Americans go to the moon? Yes. Why... Wait, sorry, uh, six times. In Russia, many still doubt that Americans actually went to the moon. Uh, well, it's not just Russia. I was um, in the bank last year or so, and the guy looked and said, Coltec, tell me, did we really go to the moon? I said, yeah, we really did. He went, I don't think we did. So it's an international phenomenon. Was he American? He was, yes. You know, uh, so an international phenomenon. Why hasn't uh, NASA proven it in some way? Is there something out there that would, like, body bag this whole issue so everyone would go, yeah, we went to the moon, let's move on? I don't know what extra proof people want when, uh, in addition to pictures, you've got rocks from the moon. Their isotopic makeup is uh, a little different from, uh, like, it's not the same as... So it's not asphalt from, like... It's not asphalt. It's not even brick, okay? <laughs> Meaning you can compare brick and a moon rock, and this might surprise you, but they are different. Is Gagarin as famous in the States as Neil Armstrong? In general, people know who Gagarin is. I've been uh, at, uh, at a party a couple of years ago uh, that was dedicated to Gagarin. It was, I was probably the only Russian attending. It was uh, a huge crowd of enthusiasts, Gagarin enthusiasts. It was um, in downtown LA. It was... Uh, a massive, an absolutely massive, huge party. It was called Yuri's Night LA. Yep. Uh, who were these geeks? Uh, they were just people in costumes? Some of them did wear costumes and some didn't. It was uh, a crowd of people just generally fascinated with all things space. And uh, it was all organized under Gagarin's name. Uh, and there was uh, some American astronaut even delivered a speech. Um, overall, it was fun. Do aliens exist? Um, you know, I haven't met one yet, but generally speaking, if we, if we multiply the odds of life starting on the planet, by the number of planets where it can start, I find it hard to believe that the result would be one. I mean, I find it hard to believe that in our galaxy that has 10 by the power of 12 stars, a trillion stars, and every star has at least uh, one planet or so. Uh, our current statistics show that each star 
has approximately at least one planet, I find it hard to believe that we're the only ones. I mean, that we're the only life. I believe that life, as a biological phenomena, should be fairly, fairly common. Now, uh, whether there are civilizations out there that reach a high level, um, you know, well, that I cannot answer. I don't know the answer to this. So, uh, you're a believer in some biological manifestations of life rather than humanoids with blasters that can show up at any moment? Yes, I I believe in the biological phenomena, and uh, I'm fearful of humanoids with blasters. Elon Musk, uh-huh. genius or quack? He's uh, he's an uh, an entrepreneur. Like, he's an entrepreneur, a genius, or a quack? It's often both, actually. Yeah. So, Elon Musk, where he gets full credit, uh, is that he uh, one by one came up with uh, ideas that people. The people laughed at, and uh, then he made them work one by one. This is something I can call 100% his success. But uh, do I take heed of his ideas about about the universe? Mm, not really. As as I'm doing my job, I don't go. Okay, Elon Musk said this and uh, and that, so I'm going to study something different. His He's not a genius or a quack. He he's something different. He plans to colonize Mars. Yes. Uh, is that possible? No. Um, colonization of Mars. Um, I mean, in today's world, it's impossible. Okay. Uh, I don't mean like it's uh, impossible to do ever. I I just think that in today's world, it's not what you want to. To spend your resources on, okay. Even if you turn Mars into the best planet that it could ever be, if you if you like maximize Mars's potential, it's still gonna be well total shit compared to the Earth, okay. So um, you know, if if you consider the cost of colonizing Mars, and and uh, Uh, you ask yourself whether it's doable, whether we should do it. The answer is no. If you can invest so much, you should, well, 100% invest in the Earth. How would you invest this money in Earth? Well, I think uh, that climate change and general general destruction of the environment is the... the the crisis that is approaching us and it's approaching fast like i'm i'm not a professor of science of climate but it seems to me that solving this problem will take truly truly enormous investment um, investments in both academia and business to to then disseminate these technologies You know, uh, I I truly believe that if we think about um, the lives of regular people who live on Earth, and uh, and uh, in the next hundred years, their lives, um, their lives will get a lot worse if we do nothing about the climate change. If we do nothing about the destruction of the of the environment, okay. Why do you think it's a real threat? Like yes, ice caps are melting. Ice caps are melting. Obviously, the ice caps are melting because the temperature is rising. Temperature is um, is rising. The chemical composition of the ocean is changing. What does it do? It kills the ecosystem. Uh, it completely changes the ecosystem that our planet relies on. I I find it hard to believe that humanity could continue its exponential growth in terms of population and uh, the volume of resources we extract from the Earth and um, never reach a breaking point. As... Uh, 
As I see it, this, like the data out there, I'm no expert in this, but uh, a lot of my colleagues are, they are experts, and, uh, well, they are really, really worried about it. How did rock and roll come into your life? Rock and roll came into my life when... When I was about 12 or so, I remember I heard Metallica for the first time and it was just, I had a qualitative change in my brain. Like, um, up to that point, my neurons used to be arranged this way, but this event made them change, uh, change their configuration. For several years, music became my, my whole life, even... When I was applying for university, I applied to... Originally, I think I applied to engineering physics, but uh, switched to astrophysics on the first day because I thought, okay, this is all great, but, you know, realistically, any day now will become the new Metallica, so this is all fluff. Uh, I can do astrophysics in my spare time. And, you know, I think we're about four shows away from becoming the next Metallica. Okay. Yeah, yeah four-ish, maybe five. The best that she could ever get. Get out of me, no, no. What's the most people you had at a solo gig? Well, last time we played in Michigan. Uh, this was a uh, long way from home. There was like 30 people. When we play locally, probably 100. Why do you do it? Can you explain? I do it 100% for myself. I mean, it's just something I can uh, no longer live without. Name three of your favorite bands. Metallica, Offspring, Pink Floyd. You said you dreamed of meeting uh, Dexter Holland. Yeah, he doesn't live far. and He lives in California? No, not just in California. He lives in, in the Orange County. It's like an hour drive away. I mean, I'm not a stalker. I don't know where he lives exactly. He actually just recently got his doctor's degree in microbiology. And so um, I, I have a, a ton of questions for him about, about his research. Have you read it? Yes. What did you think? Mm, looks good. I didn't understand the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Brian May has a degree in astrophysics, all right? He got a degree in astrophysics. He studied, then he founded a little band called Queen. You may have heard of it. Greg Graffin from Bad Religion got one in zoology. Uh, how do these combine? On the one hand, these people spread punk and rock music. On the other, stare into microscopes. Dexter Holland said math was as fucking awesome as punk rock. This is a quote from an interview, one of my favorite ones. See, music is like... This is our problem, actually. It's not their achievement, it's our problem. We think of scientists and poets as opposites. Few remember that Gribin Shikov has a diploma in math. He even worked at the Institute of applied math. And Vakarchuk wrote a dissertation on supersymmetry. They had an album with that LZ, yeah. And we are the weird ones, not them. Out there, you're an artistic person, you do science, it's an honorable calling. Want to do science? Go ahead. Stop doing science, you do something else. Start a punk band if you want to. Uh, Dexter Holland finished his PhD after a huge gap. He got it in 2017. He had to pause his research after the album Smash, I think. What are the odds that at some point, mm -hmm. at some point in the future, a huge asteroid will hit Earth and wipe out humanity just like one wiped out mm -hmm. the dinosaurs? Yeah, so within our lifetime, I think it is one to um, ten to the power of seven. So the odds are about one in... Uh, in 10 million. Uh, easy way to memorize this is that the last time, I mean, asteroids like that hit Earth once every 10 to 100 million years. For example, the dinosaurs went extinct 69 or 65 million years ago. I think it's 65. Uh, the odds are about the same as dying from um, a plane crash. On, on average, about 100 people die 
in, uh, in plane crashes every year, give or take, um, out of a billion. A billion passengers uh, fly every year, and given that only a hundred die, you can divide and go, okay, your odds are about 1 in 10 million. So the odds of dying in a plane crash are about the same as getting killed by an asteroid. Okay, let's say one such asteroid is headed towards Earth. Is there a chance to, well, survive it? Uh, there are a few ideas. One of the ideas is to just... Um, Earth is actually a very, very small planet on the cosmic scale. Earth's cross-section is uh, really, really small. So if um, an asteroid is far away and we manage to detect it and go, uh, it's coming right for us, uh, if we can adjust its trajectory just a little, it will miss us. A minor perturbation will do, if we create it at a long distance. There, uh, there were ideas to, to use uh, thermonuclear weapons, some suggested to just um, send a large mass to shift the asteroid uh, gravitationally, so there are ideas like that. But most likely, an asteroid won't kill us. What will? You know, you can just slip on your, on your way to work. You can die of cancer. There's a whole range of ways you can die. Out of all of these potential causes, asteroids bother me the least. Have you ever met people that were obsessively scared of things like that, like the end of the world or asteroids? Yes, tons. Where did you meet them? So, I met a couple of those at, um, at lectures, actually, and uh, I gave lectures to um, what they call the overall populace, uh, meaning not at the university, but… Uh, the general public, yeah. Yes, sometimes you get people who come to, uh, to these and to ask, is it true that in 2020 we're all gonna die from… X, I say, no, no, it's not true. But as a rule, they leave unconvinced. Do you see fear or curiosity in them? It's a combination of fear and curiosity with a sprinkle of, um, of, uh, of some search for meaning. It's uh, additional meaning to them. People find additional meaning in uh, cosmic disasters. I don't know exactly why, but I think this effect exists. Do black holes look anything like the one in Interstellar? Yes. Yeah, so uh, the way they portrayed it in the Interstellar was more than just the visualization, it was calculated. That is exactly in how they look. In fact, that uh, there's this disk around it, this like a halo. gas disk. Yes, and the fact that you can see it from above, uh, it's all real because the gravity of the black hole curves the light, so you can like see behind it. So it's actually, it's real math. Why does Saturn have rings and Earth doesn't? Earth used to have rings about four and a half billion years ago, they, they eventually became the moon. So the rings just condensed into a ball yes. and became the moon? Yes, uh, these rings effectively uh, spilled outside the... Uh, there is this characteristic uh, orbit radius outside of which gravity can turn matter in these rings into balls and... Uh, when this matter spilled out into a wide enough orbit, it turned into the moon. So the moon is, is an outcome of uh, what happened after, um, after an object the size of Mars or so hit the Earth and created rings around the Earth, and this eventually became the moon. Another question from Sergey. Okay. If we take the Enterprise spaceship and a star that's 4,000 light years away from us, it's going to take it 4,000 years to get there, right? Does this mean that there's no points for humanity and we'll never create a ship like that? 
Or is it going to be a ship that doesn't travel real fast, but instead jumps into some sort of hole and jumps out in another galaxy? So, let me try to condense it, okay? Uh, what you're asking is, will we ever reach the stars? Yeah, we will we ever reach the stars? Um, if our current understanding of physics is right, then, uh, then no. In, um, in that case, we won't colonize the, um, the galaxy, because the speed of light is, uh, is the true limit. You can't travel faster than the speed of light. It's like what you call a speed limit. It's the speed limit of how fast information can travel in, in space. And since on the cosmic scale, light is fairly slow. I mean, the closest star, the closest star is four light years away. Alpha Centauri. Well, Alpha, it's Proxima Centauri, right? So this, all this really says is uh, that we have uh, our planet, and uh, if we ruin it, and, uh, well, we won't get a second chance. We, we won't get uh, a second chance to retry or move to some other solar system or to Mars, so it won't work. Wait, so basically your job as astrophysicists and astronomers is to prove that all these dreams that if something goes wrong, we can go somewhere else is utopian, basically. A hundred percent. Observe, watch, study, but... Don't think of reserve bases. Make things work on this one. A hundred percent. This is all we have and will have in the next... Uh, it's hard to tell how many zeros after one, but it's like hundred or thousand. I mean, yes, we're not going anywhere from here. We, we have to make things work here. Coming here, I was thinking, what's the use of astronomers? You just answered it in one fell swoop, basically. At the same time, there's not much use for us. <laughs> <laughs> Who are the coolest Russian scientists, like, ever? Not in your opinion. Uh, ever? Okay. You say, okay, I have a personal opinion that may not reflect the person who was, uh, who was truly the coolest. Personal is what we want. Right. Uh, there was a dude in Russia named Chirikov. I think he died in 2008, but he... I believe he lived and worked in Novosibirsk. He, he managed to grasp the chaos theory absolutely intuitively back in 1950s. And his understanding allowed him and his students to develop this understanding a lot faster than anyone else. The reason I brought, brought him up is uh, that my, my own research uh, in about the same area of, uh, of maths and physics, uh, what, what amazed me the most wasn't even his ability to solve, like, mathematical problems, but his intuition. He had an intuitive understanding of chaos as, uh, as a mathematical phenomenon uh, that, that nobody, nobody else had. So... What a great imagination he had. Look, okay. you play in a rock band. Uh-huh. You jog. You do karate. Am I getting it right? Yeah, yeah, all true. You box. You surf. You launch modal aircraft. They operate and fly like drones. Yep, yep. You longboard. You ride a purple bike. Is it yours or just random? No, no it's mine. Why have you ridden it? Yes. You play paintball. Yes. You read lectures all over the world. When do you work? All the time. I'm uh, in the paintball game and I'm thinking, okay, 
the derivative of the electric field with uh, respect to time is equal to this and that. So I work constantly. I literally work constantly. During this conversation, I paused a lot because I was solving equations in my head about sport. Okay, you mentioned jogging, karate, all of that. If you uh, don't do it, your brain degrades. I dedicate a portion of my of my day to it every day because you you just simply need it to not keel over. Okay, I mean every if now well as for lectures, it's truly a huge. Uh, a massive upside. I've uh, visited a ton of places with my uh, with my lectures, and it's a huge upside to being a professor. It's something I truly enjoy. But at the same time, I uh, work constantly. If I'm on a flight, I'll work on the plane. I'll work while. I'm in the cab, I work constantly, and I don't just uh, think about planets. I do my scientific work whenever I get the chance. We've shown a ton about how a uh, Caltech professor lives. People want to know how much professors make here. Well, I'm bound by my NDA. I uh, can't give you the exact number, but I can tell you this. On uh, average, in the US, at a good university, a professor who's just starting out will make somewhere around $100,000, uh-huh. approximately. As you grow, um, it might go up a bit, but uh, it's almost never... Uh, I mean... You need to be some four-time Nobel Prize winner to make more than 300,000. That's per year figures, right? Yes, it's per year. The viewers should take this money uh, when they get the ka dollar sign in their eyes uh, and deduct the huge tax that can often go up to 50%. Yes, the taxes are pretty high here because uh, there's income tax, there's property tax. Yeah. If you own property, you pay this tax. You pay for uh, medical insurance, um, pension, uh, and then the the non-existent pension, you need to accumulate it yourself. Adding the fact that uh, prices here in California are pretty high, it's... Uh, It's a very good salary, but it's not astronomical. Not astronomical. That's a good one. It's astrophysical. Flash quiz. I ask short questions. Your answers don't have to be short. Okay. Which one would you be more proud of? A Nobel Prize or a Grammy? Um, Obviously a Grammy. Obviously a Grammy. Name three places in America that every Russian should visit. Mm. Probably Los Angeles, New York, and the geometric midpoint between them. What's that? Do you recall? Uh, I have no idea. The middle part of America is totally different, right? Totally different. It's like, like a different country. How is it different, just briefly? Well, it's, it's more like countryside. It's more... Um, people think slightly differently, and uh, I don't. I don't mean uh, it's like they're worse or something. They're just they have different standards of living. They have different values. Burgers or pelmeni? Pelmeni dumplings, by all means. Oh, stop lying. No, hundred percent. I'm going home soon, and I'm gonna eat pelmeni. Are you serious? Totally serious. Uh, whose job is that? Your wife's, or do you buy them at a store? She and I, we both. Uh, when we go to the store, we sometimes both buy pelmeni. I love pelmeni. But they're only in Russian stores. No, American stores too. You can get pelmeni right there in Trader Joe's. Sheldon or Leonard? Sheldon. Uh, Joker or Batman? Batman. Do you love the film Brother 2? I can't say I love it. It's a little, um, you know, a little surreal, but um, I'd say it's it, it's fun. Yeah. Wherein is strength? 
I'll give you an idealistic sort of answer. I think strength is in knowledge. Contest time. What's your gift for our viewers? Uh, I have uh, here uh, a wonderful book. Uh, It's called uh, Galactic Dynamics. Study it. Right, uh, a book about galactic dynamics in English. It's uh, certainly something not everyone will be able to crack, but might motivate someone to learn English or whip it into shape. To read a book brought from California Institute of Technology. The contest is very simple. The ninth planet, as we've learned, will most likely be discovered. You once jokingly said you wanted to call it White Dragonfly Block. <laughs> yep. You saw the parody show? Uh, yeah, 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 I saw it. Um, yeah, Galkin, Galkin sang it. Maxim Galkin. Have you ever heard the original? I heard the original song too. It's sung by a guy in glasses. Yep. Yeah, Nikolai Voronov is his name. Uh, I want to go back to 2006, I think. It's where it's from. So, everyone, come up with a name for the ninth planet and leave it in the comments. Better than the Dragonfly of Love? Better than that. <laughs> better. It won't be easy. It won't be easy Not to a find a question. better name than White Dragonfly of Love. Do it. We'll have a separate thread for the contest to uh, prevent discussion and contest comments from mixing together. Because comments under the Porn Films episode were a complete disaster. We will have a separate thread for your names for the ninth planet. Konstantin, thank you so much. Thank you, Yura.